So if you have a Bible, you can turn to Acts chapter 5, starting in verse 33. If you don't have a Bible, don't worry. We have one for you at the Welcome Center as a gift, and we'll also have all the passages on the screen so you can follow along. So out of reverence for God's Word, let's stand. I'm going to start in Acts chapter 5, verse 33, and I'm going to read to verse 42. Uh, for those that don't know, the big, uh, the big numbers are the chapters, and the little ones are the verses. So uh, chapter 5, starting at verse 33. This is God's word. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to them, men of Israel, take care that you, uh, what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, Thedius rose up claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas, the Galilean, rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice, and when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were accounted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we ask for grace to understand your word. We ask for grace to live it out. We ask for grace not to miss the main point. We ask for grace not to come here and go to church and have an overinflated view of ourselves, but to walk away with a high view of you, filled with love for you, filled with love for other people, fueled by your word. We know you, we need you for this, and we ask for it. Amen. You may be seated. A few years ago, we, I had a conference in Colorado, and we decided as a family to drive there. And I don't know why. <laughs> it was, looking back, it wasn't really the best decision, but we decided to drive. And if you've never driven to Colorado, there's what's called the Great Plains before you get there. So if you've never driven on the Great Plains, just imagine the flattest thing you've ever seen, and it's flatter than that. That's, that's the Great Plains. And as you're driving trying not to fall asleep, in the distance you'll start to see the mountains. And you see the mountains and you're like, oh, we're close. And you drive an hour, and you drive another hour, and it dawns on you that you're not close at all. And when we were making that drive, I I remembered something that I, I once read or I learned in school about Lewis and Clark when they were traveling across the Great Plains. The reference that they had for mountains were the Appalachians. So they saw mountains in the distance, and they're like, oh, we have only, I can't remember what it was, like a week left. And a week went by, and it still looked the same size. So as they got closer and closer to the mountains, they became more and more scared. Because like, these must be huge mountains. And then you can imagine them as they're going across the Great Plains, they get to the mountains, and you climb the first one. Like, okay, that's right. We just have to somehow get past this mountain. They climb the first one, and they get to a point where they can see, and they're like, it's an entire range of mountains. And the feeling that they must have felt, like seeing that for the first time, it's like, how in the the world are we going to get past these mountains? And I think sometimes in the Christian life, it's like that. 
you just see in the distance and you realize more and more of like, oh, this is going to be hard. You're like, okay, I just need to push through this one struggle, this one barrier, this one hurdle in the Christian life. And you climb the first mountain and you're like, wait, there's a whole range? And you don't know just how, how are we possibly going to get through this. And you realize it's going to take a lot of bravery and it's going to come with a lot of suffering. And in this passage this morning, we see the apostles, the first followers of Jesus, the first leaders in the early church. They are in front of a range, and they are going to have to have a lot of bravery, and they are going to go through a lot of suffering, but they're going to go through that suffering with joy. So we're going to look at the, those two things, the bravery of the first apostles and also their joy in suffering. But we're not just going to look at those two attributes. We're going to look to the source. How did they get that bravery? You know, it's one thing to be like, oh, great, they're brave. <laughs> you know, it's, it's another thing to realize, well, how did they get it? Like, how were they infused with this bravery? Where did they get it from? How did they have joy in that suffering? What, what type of thinking? What type of, as, as Christians would say, what type of grace did they receive to have that type of joy? That's what we're going to look at. So two things, the source of bravery and the source of suffering. First, the source of bravery. Verse 33 says this, When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. So last week, we looked at what Peter and the other apostles said. And basically, every time they had a chance in front of a crowd, they would go through the basics of what Christians called the gospel, the good news. They would go back to what Jesus came to do. He was born into this world. He died for the sins of the world. He conquers death in three days, offering up freedom from sin, freedom from death, and hope for eternal life. And he ascends into heaven and now rules over everything. They just go through the basics of what is the gospel. Here it is. And this council, this is the same council that orchestrated the death of Jesus. Instead of hearing it and accepting it, they get mad and they want to kill them. You, you just think of the apostles, they knew what happened. They knew what happened with Jesus. They watched it happen. And they knew that this was the same group of guys, the same group that had the power, that had the influence. And they still go in swinging every single time. This is what is true. This is what you did. This is what Jesus did for you. An incredible, incredible amount of bravery. Well, what is bravery? They had an incredible amount of it, but what is it? I, I've been thinking about that this week, what it is bravery. And I think sometimes people confuse their terms uh, with bravery and what other people would just call foolish or stupid, stupidity and bravery. They sometimes look the same, but they're not the same. I don't know what it is, but in the algorithms of social media, um, a part of me was like, you know, I think there are a lot of things happening in national parks with people that are visiting and just being stupid. And then I, I thought about it some more. I'm like, no, I think I just, this is clickbait for me. And the algorithms know it. So I, I've been seeing some things pop up on my social media feed that are just plain stupid. And I wanted to show a video of something I've seen recently. I swear it has a point. It's not just a funny video. It really does have a point. Let's show the... Even from a distance, witnesses could clearly see the agitated bison charging. The attack unfolding this week at Yellowstone National Park, leaving a 34-year-old man with injuries to his arms after he was gored. The massive bull bison first closing in on two adults and a child when a third man rushes in to help. The bison, which could weigh up to 2,000 pounds, briefly lifting him off the ground before the man and child could run to safety. Even from a yeah, I think that's good. So what we see in the, this video is we see a good example of both stupidity and bravery. Now, we don't know everything that happened beforehand, but why in the world would you have your child or your grandchild? I, I don't know from the video. Like, why in the world would you be that close? It's just not smart. It's foolish. But then the guy who sees that they're in trouble rushes over to help. What is that? Bravery. Here, here was an, that was two summers ago. Here's a picture from this summer. This happened, I think, a number of months ago, this, sometime this summer. And what gets me is 
the bison's not even in the picture at this point. <laughs> it's like, it's like, what is she doing? The bison's not even, that's foolish. That's stupid. So what's the difference? What's the difference between bravery and stupidity, even though they might look very similar at times? The difference is bravery actually thinks it through, counts the cost, and does it for a good reason. It's like if you talk to those, those parents, like, hey, why were you there with your kid? There's just no good reason of like, you know, we wanted to see what the bison smells like. It's like there'd be just no good reason. But the guy who's like, I'm going to rush over and help them, no, that's a good reason. That's bravery. Bravery thinks it through. Bravery counts the cost. Bravery says, okay, I'm going to do this. It's risky, but I'm going to do it anyways because it's worth it. Now, what was the reason for the apostles? As we've looked through this summer, there, there's a reason that they give twice before this council. And I'm just going to remind us, uh, for the sake of just bringing us all up to the, the present, the, the two things, the thing that they say twice is, who are we to obey, God or man? They say it twice in front of this council. They say, stop preaching this. Like, what are we going to do? Who are we going to obey? Are we going to obey you or are we going to obey God? That's the reason. They thought it through. They were like, okay, we've weighed out the options. You, you're this council, a group of people, and God. They weighed it out, they thought it through, and they proceeded with bravery. Now, in this story, we don't, we don't see them, in this section, we don't see them say that. They, they said it just a few verses up. But we see a guy in the council reach a logical conclusion. We see that he's not one of the disciples, he's not one of the apostles, but he, he thinks it through. And this is what we see, starting in verse 34. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, Pharisees were early teachers, early Jewish teachers. They knew the Torah from front to back. And Gamaliel, uh, we know from history, is one of the most prominent of all the teachers of the time. If you've heard the name or the rabbi of Hillel, he was one of Hillel's students. So he, he was a very prominent teacher at the time. And Christians, he's famous for Christians because we know that he taught the Apostle Paul before the Apostle Paul became a Christian. So he stands up, and he's one of those guys that stands up and everybody's going to listen to him. You know, it, there are some people, it doesn't matter if they wave their arms, it doesn't matter if they jump up and down, people aren't going to listen. But he's one of those guys that all he has to do is stand up and it, it quiets. He stands up, and this is what he says. Men of Israel, verse 35, take care what you are about to do with these men. Like, listen, be careful what you're going to do with these men. And then, for the next two verses, he gives two examples. Two people that in, in recent history, people that they would have known of, had risen up, gathered a following, but then it all ended. You know, they had an insurrection, they had a battle, they, they, had, a, they had a teaching, and people came along, it, it created some, it, you know, it made the news, okay? It made the front paper in the Jerusalem Times. I don't know, whatever they had, it was stone back then, they, they etched it out. And, but it's like, whatever they had, it, it came out, everybody knew about it, and they're like, but it ended, it ended. And that's what's going to happen. And then he, this is what he, he, this is his response. His conclusion. So in the present case, with this case with Jesus, this case with the early disciples, with, the, with these apostles, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this under, undertaking is of man, it will fail. Like we know if this is something that they're just conjuring up, if this is something that's like, okay, we'll just do as people, it's not going to last. It's like, they're like, they're very few people. Yes, they had seen thousands at this time, convert, but in the whole grand scheme of things, there's still just a, such a small movement in such a large world. And then he says, but if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. If it is of God, you will not be able to stop it. If it is of God, there's no, it doesn't, you can try to step in front of that train, but it's not going to work. That's what he's saying. You will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. Now, we don't know that Gamaliel 
became a Christian. We don't know anything of the back, back story. All we know that he's, he's reaching some logical conclusions. He's like, either they're from man or they're from God. They seem very persistent. It seems like they have some bravery. It seems like they really, deep down, actually believe it. So what is the source of that? Well, they might be crazy, or it actually might be from God. So how about we just wait and see? Guys, let's, let's just wait and see what's going to happen. So we look at this, and we see the apostles' example. We see Gamaliel putting the pieces together. We see that they're going to obey God rather than man. And it leads us to this question. Okay, what is the source of Christian bravery? What is the source of this bravery? And I'd say the answer here, and there are probably many ways to answer this question, the answer here is knowing the supremacy of God. Another way of saying that is knowing that God is God. Like knowing that he is, he is actually enthroned and he actually rules over everything. God is God. He is supreme. He is over all. He created everything. For example, if everyone in the world, 7 billion-ish, I, I think we're at 7, billion, 7 to 8 billion, whatever, it's probably 8 billion now, I don't know, I haven't checked. A lot of people, okay? If we all decided, let's just vote to make trees purple, okay? Everybody, wouldn't it be cooler? Purple trees, let's do it. You guys want to vote for that? And unanimously, we vote for purple trees. And we're like, we did it. What would happen? We would look around, and God would be like, sorry, I made them green. I made them it's, It wouldn't matter. Like, we, we don't have the, the power just to flip the switch. And make, it's like, we are people. Or if we all of a sudden said, we voted unanimously, God, we just don't want you to be God anymore. We'll be in control. Unanimous decision. All of humanity. Be like, it's like, it's, it doesn't really matter. It's like we all vote. It doesn't really matter. It'd be like if my kids came to me and said, we had a vote. You're not our dad anymore. It's like, you know, what would I, what would I say? I'm like, dinner's at six. Sorry. Like, it's like, it's like, because I am their dad. It doesn't matter. Like, that's who God is. He's supreme over everything. He rules over everything. He's, to use a biblical term, he's sovereign over everything. There was an early uh, church father named Athanasius, and he went against a lot of false teaching at the time in the 300s, and he was deeply persecuted. He was constantly being kicked out of cities, constantly, like, people accused him in front of the emperor. Constantine was the emperor at the time. They accused him of uh, not having wheat to be shipped to a certain city. So they're like, he was the one that made this idea. It's like completely false. But he was in exile for a long time because people lied about him. But he kept on pers persisting in the truth that Jesus was God. Jesus was God. He kept on persisting. And at one point, somebody came to Athanasius, uh, according to, to history, and said, Athanasius, don't you know that the world is against you? Don't you know the world is against you? Against you? And Athanasius said this. It's like, well, then Athanasius is against the world. That's where we get the Latin phrase, you, you might have heard it, contramundum, against the world. Where do you get that? <laughs> you know, where do you get the stones to do that? And it's like, you get it, you get it from knowing that God is God. Like, he's the one that rules over everything. And even if you're in the minority, but he's on your side, you're in the majority. It's like even if, okay, you're the one person that says, I like the green trees. It doesn't, it's like you're with God, and God rules over all. And this creates so much steadfastness. It's, it's like if there's injustice in the world, and it's like going to be on, actually unpopular to stand up for injustice, so it creates like this tenacity to do it. This is what it keep. Uh, you know, if you're in a workplace and there's something that needs to be said, you're like, okay, no, I'm going to speak on behalf of God. I'm going to say this is what is right. This, this is what in friendships gives you the strength to like speak in love, speak what is true. Bravery, real bravery. But at the same time, 
not triumphalistic. At the same time, not cocky. You know, it gives us confidence and it gives us bravery, but at the same time, it doesn't mean that we should walk around like Connor, you know, Christian Conor McGregor's. You know, it's like walking around with a strut. Because it's not us. It's not us that have the power. It's not us that has the strength. We're, we're just following orders, so to speak. We're, we're just following the person that is in charge. And we have right expectations of what it's going to look like. This is what it says in Hebrews, kind of shaping some of those expectations. Hebrews 11, uh, 30, starting at verse 32, says, And what more shall I say for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Japheth, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were torn. Okay, well, I'm going to stop there. Got ahead of myself. And you like you read that first bit, and you're like. Bravery. You know, we can conquer the world. Look at all the things that God has done up until now. That's what the writer of Hebrews is giving. Through faith, these people, did, they saw all these amazing things. And then without skipping a beat, there's not even a pause there, as you can see as I was reading. There's not even a pause, and this is what he says. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. Bad. It's like that's that's a sobering reality. So, like seeing that God rules over all, that shouldn't create this cockiness, shouldn't create this triumph, this triumph, walking around. No, no, no. we have, we should have proper expectations. God is God, and sometimes things in our lifetime will work out well, and you'll see Him reign, and you'll see things happen, and sometimes it will look like being sawn in two, and not figuratively. Yeah, just walk around in Providence, and you see these beautiful churches, beautiful structures. You walk in, uh, I was walking around with someone yesterday, and we did, it's like we saw this church, we're like, let's go in and let's just knock and see if they'll let us in. They let us in. It's a beautiful building. And you know that this, this morning, there are some people that are in there, but for the most part, they're empty. Very few people. And you know they didn't make those seats for nobody. There was a time where all those seats in the city with all the churches were full. You know, and it's like, we, we didn't choose to be born in this time, and they didn't cho- choose to be born in that time. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. Like, we, we just serve God with bravery, regardless of the season we find ourselves in. We, had a, we have a mission trip team here, just uh, some people coming and, and serving the church. We're so thankful for them, but I was uh, just shared something with them earlier of this page, this page in the Bible. Let me show you. It's right here between Exodus and Genesis. Right here, this page. This page symbolizes 400 years. Because in the first part of Exodus, it gives us a summary of 400 years of time. You just flip one page, 400 years like that. And it's a good reminder for us because it it tells us that God tells stories with centuries. And again, we don't know, are we going to be born in a a time where each each church is full or are we going to be born in a time of persecution, being sawn in two, triumphant victories in war, uh, you know, for, for the right reasons, or just destitute. We don't know. But we serve a God who's in charge of all the variables. And it's worth it. He's supreme over everything. So that's the source of bravery. The Christians should continually go back to the source of bravery. But then it's not just that. It's not that they were just willing to put their necks out there. They were like happy to do it. 
They did it with a smile. And they did it, you know, they chuckled on their way in and they chuckled on their way out. They, were, they, they had a happiness with it. And this is where we see the joy in suffering. This is what it says in verse 40. And when they had called in the apostles, so they, they had this meeting, Gamaliel is saying, hey, let's not oppose God on accident, okay? Let's bring him back in. They beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So <laughs> evidently, everyone's like, okay, Gamaliel, we hear your point. Let's still beat them. <laughs> so they beat them, and we know that the type of beating that they would give, it's called a 40 minus 1, because 40... Um, was seen as excessive, so they would count to 39 so they wouldn't get to 40. And we don't know the type of whips that they would use, but the Romans, the type of, if they copied what the Romans would use, it would be a cat of nine tails. So it would be a whip with nine tails. That's why it was called a cat of nine tails. Oftentimes with shards of glass or rock or you know just harder things that would catch into the flesh. People would die from some of these beatings. So we, we don't know exactly what they used um, for their Jewish, uh, the, the, that council's punishment. But we know that's what, the, what was common at the time. Very, very harsh beating. That's what they received. It would not be nothing for most of us living in our current time and place. For most of us, it would be the worst suffering we would experience in our entire lives. Okay, that type of beating. Certainly not for everybody, but for a lot of us. And this is their response. Verse 41. And they left the presence of the council. This, this is as they walk out the door. You know, this wasn't a few months later, you know, after thinking about it, really in the long term, it was really, it's like, this is as they're walking out the door. As they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they are accounted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And what they mean is the name of Jesus. It's like, they were worthy to suffer dishonor. It's like, what a great honor. They were rejoicing, partying. They remembered the words of Jesus where he says, if, if people persecute you, throw, you know, throw a party. Rejoice when people persecute you. What a radical thing to do. What a radical thing to say. And this is not in our nature. This is not how we normally function as people. In fact, if you're, if you're a parent, you know this. Even more so. You know, you know this. There are times as a parent where you, you're like, you know what, I'm really going to bless my kids. I'm going to take them to a carnival. We're going to spend like $1,000 on one ride. <laughs> it's, whatever. it's not that much, but it's a lot. It's a lot. They're like, we'll accept cash or your left hand. That's how expensive the carnivals are. You go and you, you go to a carnival. You are like, they really like pizza. We're going to get a pizza. Yay, pizza. And it's past their bedtime. We even stayed up past their bedtime. And you drive by an ice cream shop, and someone from the back asks for ice cream. You're like, no, it's past their bedtime. We're not going to get ice cream today. Sorry, buddy. And then you hear just a worst day ever. <laughs> you know, it's like something like that. It's like, just like the ki like kids, that's just in us. That's in us. And it, we can laugh because it's, you know, that's a fictional story with a lot of truth in there uh, <laughs> for, my ki for my kids. We can laugh at that. But it's like if the air conditioning is not working correctly in our house, like how, how quick are we like, oh, this is just the worst. It's like most of humans have gone without air conditioning just fine. It's like less than 100 years in homes, and it's like, it's like this is the worst day because we don't have cold air blowing on us continually. It's like, what a, we don't rejoice in just a very minute suffering, very small suffering. What kind of source did they have to give them power to rejoice in this suffering? What is the source? I think it's, there's probably a lot of ways of answering this, but I think the source is this, knowing the worth of Jesus. It says they counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. They just saw Jesus as so worthy. So worthy that it's like, if we can just experience a little bit of what he experienced, oh, what an honor. What an honor that is. 
Now, what, what would give this view of him being worthy? Well, the first thing for them is what they had just explained to the council. What Christians call the gospel. How Jesus died for their sins. How he resurrected, conquering death, ascended into heaven, rules over everything. Like, I think it's, like, that's the basis of why they would see it as worthy. That I was a sinner before God. Guilty before God. I have done so many things that I knew at the time were wrong. And Jesus, instead of uh, smiting me dead at that moment, he came down to this world and died for my sins, and died for my shame, and died for my guilt. What an amazing thing. What an ama- and not just dying for, for me so I don't receive the punishment, but reconciling with me. So I can know him in a deep way. So I can be his child. What a beautiful thing that is. And they saw the worth of Jesus in that. They saw the worth. And they were willing to sacrifice for it. They're will- and not only that, they were ha- going to have joy in that. That is what fueled them. Fueled everything in their life is they saw his worth. They saw how much they loved, or he loved them. And what worth does is worth drives sacrifice and suffering. Worth drives sacrifice and suffering. I'm currently on the market of looking at, at cars and, and trying to decide, make a wise decision. And if someone come, came up to me and said, you know what, we would like to give you a car for $10,000. Right now, $10,000. What would my answer be? What would my answer be? Well, it depends. <laughs> it depends on the car. You know, a, a few weeks ago, I was walking with uh, Kirk, who, who goes to church here, and we walked by uh, a Lamborghini that's just parked here on on Washington. And I'm not a car guy. So he's like, hey, how much is that car worth? And I'm like, I don't know, probably something crazy, like $80,000. And he's like, it's worth $200,000. $200, and I'm like, I like threw up a little bit in my mouth. <laughs> I'm like, it's like, that's, that's a lot of money. <laughs> it's like, but it's like, if that's the car, they're like $10,000 right now. It's like, I'm finding a way. I'm calling friends. And it's like, I don't even like cars. I'll sell it to somebody else. It's like, it's like, because you see the worth, you're willing to make the sacrifice. Worth drives sacrifice. And if we see the worth of Jesus, if we see who, him for what he actually is, and we see the love that he has for us in reality, we'll do anything. We'll just do anything for him. You have people right now that if they called you, you would drop whatever you're doing. You'd be like, I'm... An, I'm in church. Oh, that's going on? Don't care. I'm leaving. It's like, we, right now, because we just think they're worthy of our time. They're just a family that we've been with forever. They're, di- they're friends that have been with us forever. There are probably even celebrities that we don't even know, that we would drop everything to do, to do something for. Like Taylor Swift wants me to be her personal footrest. Okay, I'm there, whatever. It's like, it's like because we just see... Her is worthy. I would not. I would not do that. By the way, it's like, it was like I knew you were trouble when you walked in. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna do that. Um, but it's like because we see that they're worthy, we're willing to sacrifice. Worth drives sacrifice every single time. So if you find yourself in a place in the Christian life where you look at the precipice, uh, you're on the mountains, and you're looking like, how could I possibly do this? and you find yourself not willing to sacrifice or doing it begrudgingly, I guess I'll just uh, trudge through the Christian life again. You know, if, that, if that's your attitude, you know the reason. You do not see Christ as worth. You do not see his value. You do not see his love. There's something wrong in your thinking. Now, obviously, sometimes you can view things as these are the sacrifices I should do, and God's like, I didn't ask you to do that. Where'd you learn that? It's like, there's sometimes like that. 
That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about things that are very clearly, this is what God wants me to do. I'm like, oh, I don't know if I'm willing to. He is worthy. He is enthroned. He is worth it. Worth drive sacrifice. And then the last verse, verse 42, this is what they do. They go back to what got them in front of the council in the first place. They go back to what uh, got them to the beating in the first place. They go back to what got them previously, a, a, a chapter earlier, in jail in the first place. The next verse says this, verse 42, And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. For the just Jewish audience, the Christ was the Messiah. The Christ is the one that would bring salvation. The Christ was the one that would make everything right. That this one who is going to make everything right is Jesus. They wouldn't stop. Can you just imagine, you're that council. I'm like, we just beat them. We threw them in jail. We killed the one that they were following. What's going on? They must actually believe it. They must actually see his worth. They were willing to sacrifice everything. And they were willing to do it with these two things, preaching and teaching the word. For them, that was the tip of the spear, preaching and teaching the word. You see in Acts, they weren't against like helping people in their physical needs. That was a big part of the early church. They, they weren't against loving the saints and taking, you know, having meals together and having genuine community together in the church. They were all for that. You see that just in the, in the text. But the tip of the spear was preaching and teaching the word. And the reason, because they knew that if people truly understood what Jesus had done and truly believed what Jesus has done, that that would change everything. That like a, a, an apple tree that starts just as just a little, little growth and just a branch that grows up, that eventually you would create apples. That eventually they would start loving their neighbor. That eventually they would start loving their fellow brothers and sisters in the church. That eventually they would start helping the poor. That eventually everything would just grow naturally because they understood the worth of Jesus. So they went back to it preaching and teaching the Word. And this is why, as a church, every week, it just seems so basic. You know, Alex and I were joking before church, like, there's, a, there's some hula hoops that we probably need to find a place for that, for the kids' festival last week. And it was, we were just joking about, hey, I could really liven things up, hula hoop on stage this week. <laughs> it's like, I'm not going to do that. You know why? We're just going to do what's boring. We're just going to open up, and like, this is what God said. Because you don't need a hula hooping guy on stage. You don't need a hula hooping pastor. What you need to hear is the worth of Jesus in his word. And through that, he'll empower everything. He'll give hope in everything. He'll give joy in suffering. And he'll give bravery, genuine bravery in this world.